imagine that you're in this new, completely unfamiliar environment, and that you can't see. How would you get around? What senses would you rely on? How would you know what's in front of you, behind you, or whether or not something's moving towards you? Well, blind people face this challenge every day. We're Team Navigate, and we're trying to develop a solution to this problem. I'm Jenny, and presenting with me today are Yael and Ryan. The other members of our team are Yolanda, Emily, Agnes, Nick, John, Ryan, Budong, Alec, and Frank. Our team mentors are Dr. Roma Chalapa and Dr. Chaman Tang, and our team librarian is Ms. Robin Dasser. Blindness is a worldwide disability that affects 45 million people. Although there are existing technologies today for the blind, a lot of them are unaffordable and inaccessible. In addition, there are a lot of electronic tablets that are in place for the blind today, but a lot of them use GPS, and none of them deal specifically with indoor navigation. So our research question is this. How effectively can computer vision techniques and depth data be used and implemented into a portable navigational system for, for the blind? We believe that the Microsoft Connect, along with the white paint, can be used for a very portable navigational aid for the blind to increase accuracy and speed of navigation. We think the Microsoft Connect will be especially suited to our project because it is relatively inexpensive as, a, as compared to stereo vision cameras, which cost several thousand dollars. And it also has very accurate RGB and depth data. Okay, so this is an iterative research design project because we developed a small part of the device, we tested it, and then we um, repeated that process. And this process can be illustrated within the three phases of our methodology. So for the first part of our preliminary research, we had to conduct interviews with our blind subjects, and we wanted to do this in order to gauge their preferences for our device. So we sampled from both the Columbia Lighthouse Institute as well as the National Federation of the Blind, and we conducted interviews over the phone in May 2013. One of the main concerns we had while conducting our interviews was distinguishing between those people that were born blind and those people who develop blindness throughout their life due to their varying perceptions toward our device as well as their, as well as their differing ability to adapt to using such a technologically savvy device. In addition, these blind subjects identified various challenges they face when navigating through an unfamiliar environment. One of these challenges is identifying landmarks. So this has to do with understanding the environment that they are in. Another, uh, another challenge is identifying unexpected obstacles in their environment. So for example, if they were walking towards something, identifying exactly what that object is. Lastly, it's hard for them to know how to get from distance A to distance B. So this has to do with the GPS component. All right, so during the preliminary research, we decided what our physical device is actually going to be consisting of. It's going to have a Microsoft Connect to get data from the environment. It's going to be getting 3D depth data and color images, which we can combine with computer vision algorithms to get a good idea of what the user is actually facing and what's in front of them. We're going to be using the Microsoft um, Surface Pro as our computing platform. We're using it because it's affordable, relatively, compared to a large supercomputing cluster. It's fairly powerful, and it works wonderfully with the Microsoft Connect. You just plug and play, since you're both made by the same company, and it's very nice. We're also going to be using the, we're also going to be using the GoPro mount, as John is sporting right now, to <laughs> mount the camera to the user. We're using that because it's specifically designed for mounting cameras to people, and do so in a stable and, well, quite effective manner. So that's going to be our physical makeup of our device that you can see right here, it works very well. For software, we have determined three algorithms that we are uh, going to be using to get a good idea of what's actually in front of the user. Because computers, they don't understand vision at all. But for us, we have very complicated neurological processes which determine what we're actually looking at. Computers, we need to design that in hardware and software, which is very difficult to do. So what we're using is the canny edge detector to detect edges around regions. Which, as you can see here, this is a, uh, a simple street view. We highlighted the edges around certain regions. It's pretty good at locating objects. Um, we're also combining this with superpixel segmentation, which breaks things down into color regions. And what we can do with both of these informations combined is we can determine not only different color regions, but we can also 
carefully determined separate objects altogether, which we can use this information in order to guide somebody around and determine what is a viable object for classification, which for classification we're using the um, Pedro Felsenswab's image segmentation algorithm, which as you can see here, we train to find people, and it's determined that the two highlighted objects in this image are in fact people, which we know they are. So that's the basis for our software, and um, that's our preliminary research. Now currently we're in the design and implementation phase. This is when we actually start designing the physical device itself, and more importantly, designing the communication that we're going to be using to actually talk with the blind. So we're researching possible haptic feedback technologies, which haptic is kind of like when you use your phone, a lot of times you put it in mute when you're in class, and it'll vibrate telling you if you've got a message or somebody's calling you. Haptic is that vibration. It's going to be, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be mounting sensors on the shoulder pads of the uh, mounting device so that it'll vibrate on a certain side telling you which direction to move in or perhaps both of them will vibrate to tell you to stop, there's an object in front of you. We haven't entirely determined how we're going to be doing that. That's going to be part of our future research. And um, after we design that and determine which is going to vibrate to communicate what, we're going to start testing this with sighted subjects first. Um, we're using sighted subjects because they're very available. We could, we could practically ask our friends in our dorms and they enjoy doing this. We just kind of blindfold them, walk around, something will vibrate and you just react naturally, which is what we want, a natural experience. We're also going to be increasing the mobility of our device, so perhaps we might find a smaller tablet. There are even smaller 3D DAF cameras out now that we can use in the future. Um, and of course, we're going to be doing a lot of software development during this stage. Like currently, we're looking into point clouds, which this is a uh, 3D point cloud image of a commons kitchen, no, a uh, courtyard's kitchen, sorry. Now, it might look a little foreign to you, but we can use this information to break down different planes, which unfortunately this kind of doesn't work. But we can break down different planes. Like as you can see here, we have a cabinet, which we can use the 3D information to break it down into separate planes. And we can combine this plane, this planar information with um, previously collected data for 3D objects. So we can determine what's what, what's an open area, which as you can see, there's a large amount of area without any points in it. That's a safely navigable area that we could use for determining an actual path for some beach travel. So as Ryan just touched upon, we're trying to figure out the best way to communicate the information from the external environment back to the user. So, so far we've come up with four possibilities. The first possibility is audio feedback. What this entails is verbal communication to the user. So for example, if a chair was in front of them, it would actually tell them that a chair was there and the best way to navigate around the chair. In addition, it would tell them how, how far they have till they actually encounter that chair. Haptic feedback, which Ryan was also talking about, is the vibrating belt. So for example, you would feel different vibrations and they would interpret, interpret those vibrations to mean different things. Um, as he was saying, if you had a vibration on your right hand side, either this would mean go towards your right hand side or this is the side you want to avoid. And we're currently testing, um, doing tests to figure out what would be most effective. The next option is a combination of audio and haptic. So depending on the environment that the user's in, they can decide to either use audio or haptic, whatever is um, most feasible and works best. Or if they wanted to, they could use a combination of audio and haptic feedback, um, although this would probably be an overload of information and thus they would most likely not decide to do that. Lastly, we, um, it's, they can use modified haptic, and what this is, is it would be haptic feedback for a majority of the time, um, just because it is a little bit less obtrusive, and um, audio feedback when they are specifically identifying the object that is in front of them. So for our final product testing, it involves um, actually testing the device that we made. So as you can see up above, we've designed an obstacle course. In the obstacle course, there are things such as couches, chairs, plants, tables, anything that you would find in a typical indoor environment. The user is going to be asked to navigate around these obstacles and go to the end destination. So we're designing two different obstacle courses that are mirror images of each other. In one course, the user is going to be asked to navigate it with just their white cane. And in the other course, they're going to be asked to use their white cane in addition to the device. 
The reason we have two different courses is to avoid any biases they get from already navigating the, cane, uh, navigating the course with just their cane. After we finish testing, we're gonna, um, we're gonna conduct statistical analyses and we're gonna determine if it was actually significant to have the device with the cane, if they're able to uh, go through the course faster and more accurately. After we finish testing, we are gonna administer KIADS, which stands for the Psychosocial Impact of Assisted Device Scale. And this is gonna assess their competence, adaptability, and self-esteem while using the device. And this will allow for us to um, work on the device and fix it up to make it um, fit their preferences more. Now, of course, with any research project, we've run into challenges as we've tried to design our first prototype. Now, computer vision algorithms create a rather interesting challenge. They're not particularly robust in real-world contexts. Because when you think about it, there's an infinite range of information you can get from depth and image data combined. So making an algorithm that can work with anything you can possibly see and accurately recognize what's a chair, what's a person, what's not a person, is actually very difficult and requires a lot of computing power. So we're going to be making more efficient computer vision algorithms and really trying to improve and combine what's out there into something that we can effectively get to work on a tablet rather than a giant computer, which previous projects have actually utilized something that involves a $20,000 camera and a wheelchair and a very large computer mounted on the back of it. We want to simplify this into something that people can legitimately use. So um, we're also going to be working on designing a user interface, which actually presents a very interesting challenges, challenge because our user is blind. If you imagine designing Firefox, you're mostly going to be using image data. You're going to be working with buttons and pictures and words, we can't do that. We're only, we're limited to tactile feedback and audio. So we can talk to them, we can have a synthesized computer voice tell them what's in front of them, and of course we have to program all of this beforehand. And we're, we can also use a, a very limited amount of haptic feedback because we can only, we can only send information to where we put a haptic feedback sensor. So designing a user interface is a particularly interesting challenge. When we started off our sophomore year, we decided to split up into three subgroups, hardware, software, and user interface. Um, but since then, we have adopted, adopted a more fluid structure, and we have changed our group dynamic to meet the task at hand. Um, in, in our sophomore year, we were in phase one of our project. We did a lot of research on the hardware and software components of our project, and we um, completed our IRB and even got to start interviews a little. Um, Right now, we're well into phase two. We've started to implement and integrate a lot of the software algorithms that we've been researching. And we've um, <coughs> been able to gather a lot of concrete data about what the user wants from, our, from the interviews that we've completed. Um, towards the end of this year and into next year, we hope to have a fully developed prototype, test it, and then uh, make refinements on our product. So now for some advice um, for you guys as you're about to start the Jumpstone process. Definitely frequently be in touch with your librarian. Ours has definitely been an asset in helping us develop our obstacle course. Um, set realistic goals for yourself because this allows you to work towards something, but also realize that these goals may change as ours definitely had because the future, because the direction of our project has changed. And instead of viewing this as a setback, rather just view it as something new to work towards, towards the, uh, for the future. Um, keep up with your portion of the work and also remain accountable for your teammates. We. Um, it's worked for us that each subgroup checks in on another subgroup so we can make sure that we're all keeping up with our fair share of the work and that allows for us to communicate. Um, start the um, IRB process early and this will pertain to teams who are working with human subjects. It was definitely a long and grueling process for us, uh, but eventually we got it, which is great, which is why we were able to start our interviews. And lastly, um, do fun things with your team. Even though Jumpstone is an academic program, uh, by hanging out and doing things outside of this academic environment, it really has allowed us personally to collaborate better on an academic level. Um, so now we just wanted to extend a thank you to our mentor, Dr. Rama Chalaba, our co-mentor, Dr. Chavin Singh, our librarian, Ms. Robin Nassler, the Gemstone staff, and our graduate advisor, Lee Stearns. We really could not have done this without you guys. So thank you for listening, and do you have any questions?